Hello, folks. This is a very exciting episode of the Dan John Podcast. This is episode 28. I was born on August 28th, so you know today is going to be a very special podcast. Well, before I even answer questions today, I want to talk about uh, just a really simple point. I call it Coaching 101. Now, I teach uh, religious studies, and uh, uh, at, at the university or college level, 101 is usually your, your general survey courses, and I teach 101 for Columbia. Um, I have these three very simple principles. The first is invest wisely in asymmetrical risks. We're going to come back to that one. Number two is embrace the obvious, which I think is the hardest thing really for young coaches to get their arms around because, you know, and I, I always make the joke, sprinters sprint, hurdlers hurdle, throwers throw, jumpers jump, swimmers swim, bikers bike. That's the key. And people go, yeah, yeah, but um, I read this thing. Okay, stop, stop reading, get people back throwing and stuff like that. And what I do as a strength conditioning coach is I support Bikers biking, throwers throwing, jumpers jumping. And then number three is respect the process. Uh, if you respect the process, you do what you need to do every day. You take care of business. Uh, you, 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 you follow the fundamentals. You keep an eye on asymmetrical risks. The results will happen. Um, I, in my uh, art of coaching lecture, I always talk about you know, instead of trying to do a two-week diet or one-week detox, if you went to bed and slept nine hours a day, nine hours a night, I guess, and you ate protein and veggies and drank water to every meal, uh, you didn't eat crappy carbs, you know, you know, sugar and junk and soft drinks and, you know, the stuff that you're not supposed to, and you did some kind of reasonable training, two, three, five times a week, whatever, and you did that for two decades... We wouldn't be having this conversation about a two-week rapid fat loss diet because you would take care of business. If you focus on the process, the results take care of themselves. But let's sneak back to number one. You got to invest wisely in asymmetrical risks. Now, I get this from my wife, Tiffany. She works for Treasury, and her job is to keep your money safe. And so her number one job is to look at Little things that might end up being big things. And her key is this. What could go wrong? What? what? Number one job of a coach is to stand back and say, hmm, what could go wrong? You show up on a football field with 90 young boys and they want to play American football. Hmm, what could go wrong? Well, I'm telling you folks from experience, a lot. And that's what you need to think about. So I get these questions all the time, and I'm not a horrible person, but people will say, Dan, why don't you like heavy Turkish uh, get-ups? Why don't I like heavy Turkish get-ups? Hmm. I'm looking at a 16-year-old girl trying to, you know, do a Turkish get-up with the beast. Hmm. What could go wrong? A whole bunch of things. Uh, a friend of mine who trains with me in the gym has a video of himself trying to do a Turkish get-up, and as he comes down, his left hand slips with the 32K bell, it comes down and crashes on his chest. Fortunately, he's fine. But what could go wrong there? Well, let's just think about the impact of a 32 kilo bell hitting your, your heart area or down here in the softer tissue areas. Or worse, what if it hits your head? And all of a sudden, we're talking about a very serious issue that could have been easily dealt with by saying what could go wrong. Now, how you fix it is either, like in my case, we don't do heavy Turkish get-ups. Uh, I love uh, putting a, a, a coffee cup. In fact, the hotter, the better. That's a joke, okay? Uh, I usually use a Dixie cup half filled with water, and you do the Turkish get-up with that overhead. Uh, if that glass comes moves, it spills cold water on you, and we all laugh. No danger. No one gets hurt. Can anything go wrong with a one-handed kettlebell swing? Yeah, I've seen a lot of one-handed kettlebell swings that look awful. What's the worst that can happen? Uh, under ballistic load, you start twisting and moving and flexing, and something bad happens to your back. Um, what can go wrong if you're, you decide to go to the top of Mount Olympus over here and take your mountain bike and go all the way to the bottom? What possibly could go wrong? Well, why don't you wear a helmet? 
let's do that first. Maybe you ought to wear some other protective gear. So when I get a lot of questions that I, uh, especially on the Instagram account, and I'm not very good at answering the questions. I'm good at this. Folks, I'm almost 63. Ask your grandfather to text you. I text like this. So my responses are always very slow. So when I do respond to you, be under, understand that it is a moment of kindness and clarity that I'm trying to do. But sometimes people ask these questions and the first thing I want you to think about before you ask the question is when I, re when I don't recommend something, usually it's because I've already asked the question, what could go wrong or worse? And I apologize for this. I've already seen this thing go wrong and I should have been a better coach back then. So before we, before we start diving into questions, always remember to take time to think about what could go wrong. And then from there, embrace the obvious and try to make it better. And of course, if you make everything a little bit better, the results will speak for themselves. All right, let's get on to our questions, shall we? We got a question from Corey, and I got to thank Corey because Corey let us know that he doesn't want medical advice. He's working with a doctor and a therapist. Do you have any suggestions on how to modify, regress kettlebell presses in a way that puts less strain on the AC joint and surrounding tissues? I was diagnosed with arthritis by my orthopedic doctor in my right shoulder last year, and I've had to modify my training. Here's the interesting thing. I actually have some advice for you, some good advice. But he gave me no restrictions other than modify load and movements when needed. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that be nice to... <laughs> yeah, Go lighter. Well, what should I do? Go lighter. That's a, that's a tough conversation. I have full range of motion and I've found success with original strength. That's Tim Anderson's brilliant uh, mobility program that we use with everything we do to keep the joint feeling smooth. Overhead pressing can create some discomfort and impinge the ligaments tendons in my right shoulder. I have experimented with lighter loads, but are there movement adjustments that you would recommend to try? Well, first, I want you to do something opposite. I have in my, uh, my gym the book, The Kauai Study. It's an island in Hawaii. And an orthopedic surgeon was doing a whole bunch of shoulder repairs. And he decided instead of doing that, he would get 92 of his clients and do a very simple uh, thing. One person dropped out. But of the 91, all of them, all of them had improvement in their shoulders. Many of them who were slated for surgery didn't have to get surgery. And Corey, here's what they did. They hanged. Okay. Uh, hanged, hung. I got to be careful about that. I don't want you to think the wrong one here. Uh, all they did was hang. Here's the interesting, Corey. Uh, in 2017, as like an idiot, I hurt my left shoulder getting ready for the state weightlifting championships. Um, it was it was a st stupid thing, but it happened. And so for about a year, I was getting more and more concerned about my left shoulder never coming around. My friend Dan Martin told me about this book. I bought the book and I started hanging. And it's not, it's, it's no huge thing. Um, one of my workouts now, uh, I do one pull up, I hang for 15 seconds. I do another pull up and hang. Um, we have added the hanging into all of our protocols, including the deployment, the post deployment protocol that you can read uh, on uh, on the university site. Um, but basically, I'm just going to tell you to hang. And so, hanging is a game changer for shoulder issues. I don't know why. Is it poor man's chiropractic? I keep telling people it's my poor man's chiropractor. Um, is it magic? I would almost say yes. But for whatever reason, just keep reminding, Corey, you are a brachiator. Uh, you probably have opposable thumbs. You probably have your eyes here. Your bicep has, everybody knows the major uses of the bicep. One is to do Mr. Universe, you know. The second is to do that, to, you know, rotate this way. The third, of course, is to uh, bring the, 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 the forearm to the chest. But there is a fourth 
where when you brachiate monkey bars, when you brachiate, your bicep becomes more of a ligament tendon than an actual muscle. And when we were working with javelin throwers and first added this hanging and monkey bar work, our shoulder injuries disappeared. Uh, I remember Kyle saying at the end of the season, Coach, this is the first time my shoulder's not hurt. And I was like, wow. I thought, you know, the joke, I said, well, it's because of my brilliant coach. And he said, no, Coach, it's the monkey bars. Uh, okay. So what I'm going to do first for you is I want you to think about hanging in your, oh, I would say three to five days a week. Build up to it. Uh, I know that the one guy online recommends seven minutes of hanging a day in total. That's a lot, but that would be a nice goal long term. I would first, if I were you, try to hang for 30 seconds at once. Slide that up to a minute. Uh, once you get to about a minute, Corey, I want you to get back to me on this and let me know if there's been any improvement. When it comes to the kettlebell movements, the, the best thing I can tell you is this. I want you to go to single arm. So one arm at a time. And what I especially want you to think about when you're doing this is I want you to use your, it's your right shoulder. So I want you to be, every single rep on your right shoulder has to be perfect. I would even recommend half kneeling. So if it's your right, so if the weight's in your right hand, I want your right knee on the ground. And then that way, it makes sure your left big toe is pushing down on the ground as hard as you can. Make sure you're feeling those hip flexor stretch. Squeeze your glutes as tight as you can. And really, and what that's going to do is restrict your load a little bit. But it's also going to make sure every rep, every rep you are stacked up and down. Um, I would also consider if your left shoulder is feeling good, don't be afraid to push the reps on the left side. Because remember, the body is one piece. So all the magic, you know, all the hormones and all the protein and the amino acids that are working here are going to be swimming all over the body and helping you out. Um, I, Corey, I do want you to get back to me after that you try that hanging protocol for a little bit and let me know if that's helping or hurting. I wouldn't mind if you went to Amazon and bought the book, The Kawaii Study, and read it yourself and maybe even give it to your, uh, uh, your doctor to look over. Thank you so much. It's a good question. And uh, hanging, half kneeling presses, strict as you can. Okay? Thank you. Well, we have a question from Justin. And of course, you all know what I'm about to say. We got this question just in time. Sorry. When doing easy strength, when only having access to kettlebells, what variation of deadlift do you recommend? Wow, when doing easy strength just with dead, uh, with kettlebells. Uh, you know, Justin, I'm going to go into my archives and I'm going to pull up my, my attempt at the 40-day program with just kettlebells. I would have done that in 2000 and a little, no, 2013 when I was living in the condo. Uh, and I, I did a 40-day program with it. What I'll do is I'll cut and paste it. I'll make sure I pull out anything that's stupid. And I'll, and I'll share it on the site with you, okay? Um, does easy strength work with kettlebells? Yes. Does easy strength work with kettlebell deadlifts? Justin, you're going to have to help us find that, that out. I would recommend the, the classic wider stance, double kettlebell deadlift. And the only issue you can run into is the load's not going to be high enough. And I'm wondering if maybe we can have an easy strength asterisk asterisk on this uh, and that you keep your reps uh, maybe uh, maybe like a one set of 20, completely defeating the easy strength rules. But I don't think the load is going to be enough to get the response, but we can sneak it up with the reps. So try that double wide, wide stance um, on your hard day, do 20s. Uh, maybe twice a week, once a week, and on the other days, just do 10s. So if in a five-day session, one day with 20s and the others with 10. Uh, you've made it clear you're not a fan of the Turkish getup with heavy kettlebells. Yes, I like the Turkish getup. Get away from the contest of the heavy kettlebell. But for the average person, what do you consider heavy for this exercise? Well, Justin, I don't know if you know kilos or pounds, but... I would not recommend more than 200 kilos. Okay, that was a joke. 
Um, you know, honestly, um, doing it with a shoe, uh, doing it with a, 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 you know, a red, red solo cup half filled with water like this, doing it with a shoe in the same position. That's just fine for most people. And, and you're gonna say, well, that's, that's not heavy. Yeah. I, I do have, uh, I've already read your question. So I know where I'm heading on this, but really for most men, the 12, the 14 or the 16 is enough for women, the 10, the eight, those are actually can be heavy, but Justin, I knew what was coming. So let me read your last question and I'll tell you what we do. What do you think about adding a half kneeling press to the Turkish getup in the middle? I'm going to one, I'm going to one up you, uh, Justin, uh, we call this the get up press. And I think this is a far better way to do uh, Turkish get-ups than the actual Turkish get-up. So start in the start upright, standing position, do one press. Uh, uh, since my right hand is up, uh, I'll, I'll do everything with just the right hand. Um, step your left foot back into what I call the cross-country skier position. Uh, so it's, it's, the, it's a lunge position, but the knee hasn't hit the ground yet. Do one press there. So you've done two presses. Standing press, cross-country ski press, bring the left knee to the ground. Now you're in the half kneeling, press. Windshield wiper, uh, windshield wiper that foot into the, uh, in, well, we call it the kneeling windmill position. Put the hand on the ground. Now this time, you're gonna be basically doing a bent press. And that is an eye opener. You'll notice, you'll notice that, uh, you know, when that, Elbow starts uh, sneaking close to the lat. There's not a lot of room in there. Uh, swim your, your hips to the ground, and you're going to be in this, uh, uh, you know, the, the beginning position, uh, the, the tall sitting position. Press there to the, to the elbow. Press there to the ground. A floor press. Bring it to the ground. Put it to the ground. And then say, I can't believe how heavy a 12-kilogram bell just got. You also notice it takes a long time to do that exercise. Now, switch sides, start with the, um, I would prefer you start with your less dominant hand, but since I started this way, do the whole thing, do the Turkish get down press. Now, someone's raising their hand right now on the internet going, can't you just do it from the start on the ground? Hmm. You've just heard this exercise for the first time in your life and you already want to make it more complicated. Yes, you certainly can do it that way, but trust me, on this exercise, you want to do the Turkish get down a couple of times before you think about doing the Turkish get up. Uh, that's my experience talking, and that's also uh, what could go wrong on the Turkish get down, less goes wrong on the Turkish get up, more goes wrong. So let's do a couple of Turkish get down presses, Justin before you start thinking about anything else. Um, here's an interesting thing. Uh, if you do get up to the 48 kilo uh, bell on the Turkish get down with the uh, Turkish get down press, uh, I, send me the video because I, I, I'm going to be impressed. <laughs> impressed. What did the kettlebell say when it was over my head? I'm impressed. <laughs> get it? Thank you, Justin. Good question. We have a question from Daniel. That's a good name. It means God is my judge. I am 30, I'm 35 years old and I've been training mainly calisthenics for the past five years. Recently, I discovered Olympic lifting and realized how fun it is and now I wish to improve. I have my own barbell and a few bumper plates that I add to each month on payday. <laughs> I like that. I would like to take part in a local competition in about 12 months after I have practiced more. You know, Daniel, I think if you can get into a local competition, all the questions that are coming up are going to be answered. Uh, I lifted in my first meet three weeks after I saw a snatch live for the first time in my life. Three weeks. I learned so much on that platform. Uh, by the way, uh, two weeks later, I went to my next meet. And then a week later, I went to my third meet. I think within the two first two months of me lifting, I was in three meets. Um, it was interesting because nine months after my first meet, I snatched what I clean and jerked in my first meet, which is kind of the norm. 
Um, the sooner you get on the platform, the more and more you're going to learn. What's going to happen at that weightlifting meet is you're going to be around other lifters and your experience of the noise of a weightlifting meet is going to teach you so much. It's going to teach you volumes. If you can, Daniel, get yourself into a weightlifting meet as soon as possible. Uh, in Utah back in the day, Dave Turner would have all these kind of friendly weightlifting meets. And um, it was interesting because, you know, I'd be warming up with a, you know, a 13-year-old boy who's getting nervous because he was going to try to snatch the real bar for the first time, 20 kilos. And my opener was going to be 125 kilos in the snatch. But we were both just as nervous. And it's a great learning experience. I know finding a coach would benefit me. But I also enjoy lifting outside my garden. I, yeah, I love it. Which fits better into my schedule. So all my learning comes from YouTube and trial and error. God bless you for watching YouTube to learn. Oh, good luck with you. My question, what exercises can be done as accessories to benefit Olympic lifting? Let me give you the whole list. Snatch, clean and jerk. That's it. Now, there are two other exercises, the overhead squat and the front squat. One of the things I would recommend, it's, it's interesting because uh, my good friend Brian is going through our easy strength uh, Olympic lifting program right now. But what I want you to do, Daniel, is I want you to look up, go online, uh, type in Dan John Complex, and I want you to start doing Complex C, just Complex C as your warm up. It's going to be hang snatch, overhead squat, back squat, good morning, row, and then snatch grip deadlift or any variation deadlift. Um, I'd like you to work up to three to five sets of eight on that. And what that's going to do is going to, it's going to be my assistant coach, coach repetition. The more reps you do, the better and better you're going to get. So here's my set of advice for you. First, get it, get yourself into a meet as soon as possible. You know, Join, join your national organization. Uh, you, with the internet now, it's much easier to find local meets. Uh, and then try to start doing complex C. Once you get to a meet, you're going to bump into other lifters. And you might be surprised to find out that with one, within a discus throw of your house is another Olympic lifter. That's what happened with me. Um, the, the, but you have to go to the meet. Uh, I would bring a paper and pen and write down names and phone numbers and get yourself get yourself into a community. Even if you can just go to a gym one day a week, Saturday mornings is usually the best. Uh, it'll be night and day for your, your training. And Daniel, good luck to you. That's awesome. Okay, we have a question from Scott and I love the fact that Scott starts right off with a caveat. Do you have any exercise advice for folks with total knee replacement? And generally I say, I, I can't give medical advice, but Scott does. I'm not asking for medical advice. <clears throat> Just if you've had clients or acquaintances with who have had one, uh, who have had one and have had success. I've had one now for nine years due to sports and military injuries. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm 59. I crossed that fine line between being hard and being stupid too many times. It's a funny line, isn't it? Yeah. I have 120 degree flex in it and pain free mostly. You know, Scott, uh, the one of the things that I, I I'm very happy with where I'm at in my career right now is Mike Warren Brown, who trains with me four days a week, specializes in what's called age performance. He uh, he works with clients who are in their 90s, 80s, 70s. So I get a lot of information from Mike about how to train older clients with total hip replacements, total knee replacements, and garbage shoulders. But at the gym I work out, out up here at Epic, I train there three days a week. So yeah, do the math. Uh, I do two double sessions a week. Uh, I I train with a number of people who've had total hip, uh, pardon me, total knee replacements. And one of the things I would have to say to you is that this is not a career ender. Uh, one of the guys I work with now skis, man, he skis five days a week this time of year. He, he's retired. Uh, he's on both knees are replacements. Um, one of the things you, you need to do, and this is just logic, 
first is you got to deal with body composition. Uh, if you're walking around with 30 extra pounds of, of uh, body fat, that is putting a, a lot of crushing load on those knees. So do your best in the areas of, of nutrition uh, and uh, sleep and smart eating to deal with that, if that's an issue. You don't mention here, but that is just an issue. Number two, um, there are, with, with suspension trainers and uh, bands and all kinds of things in gyms now, there's no reason you can't be doing progressive resistance exercises. Uh, I would do total body work, total body, total body workouts probably three days a week, and you're going to work with that knee replacement. So does that mean, I mean, that doesn't mean you do, uh, <laughs> I was going to say drop snatches, but you probably don't know what those are, but it doesn't mean you're going to do depth jumps off of uh, a bridge, you know, for sets of 10, but you can certainly build up the quads, the hamstrings, the areas, I mean, the glutes, uh, that, well, why, I don't even know why I just use muscles, um, by doing the basics, but load is going to have to take its time. Uh, I would err on slower load increases uh, for a while. And what's going to happen if you're anything like me is one day you're going to go in the gym and magically by taking your time, magically you'll be where you were a, a decade ago. Uh, well, in your case, uh, well, uh, two decades ago. So take your time, uh, be smart, uh, whole body workouts, walk as much as you can. Uh, that seems to help. And just keep reminding yourself, this isn't a death sentence. In fact, it's it's what we call, it's what my doctor calls a God surgery. He makes the lame walk. So be positive and just keep on keeping on. Got a question from Lucas. I'd love to get back into competing in races, but as a former hurdler, sprinter, long jumper, I have no desire to do 5Ks or further. <laughs> You know, kidding. I, I meant, oh, okay. Uh, since you competed in track meets for adults, where can I find these events? I live in Indiana, but will be working across the country as a traveling registered nurse. Oh, Lucas, that's, uh, I, I, you know, what I would do right now is just type in the phrase Masters Track and Field. Now, when I was still competing, there was a great website that catered to us. USATF Masters. Dot org, And that's the best place to, to find everything. And trust me, it, there's a lot out there. If you get a chance, Arizona has a magnificent uh, uh, master's track thing going on. Uh, Arizona is, they they really are doing some wonderful things in, in master's track and field. Their track meets, I've been to a number of them. They're well run. They're the facilities are very good and the weather is great. Um, it's interesting because, uh, and this is just a personal thing, but uh, my best throws in the weight pentathlon were at a master's meet down there, but they couldn't count it as a record because at the time the rule was you had to do it at the nationals or at the worlds. And since then they've changed that, uh, oh, they've changed that rule, which breaks my heart just a little bit. So yeah, use the internet. And Lucas, if you can't find something, you're, you just email me and, and you and I will work on it together. We have a question from Alan. I've been competing in long distance running and triathlons for many years, and I'm currently training for a half Ironman. What would be a good strength training program to follow alongside the endurance training? Um, and then let's go to the follow-up questions uh, uh, just before I answer it, because most of you who have been listening know my answer. To be clear, I'm not aiming to challenge the race leaders or pass SA, SAS selection, uh, hats off to my friends near Wales, or get picked for an Olympic powerlifting team. I aim to compete rather than, uh, pardon me, I aim to complete rather than compete. That's lovely. Uh, preferably finishing with a smile on my face. I realize there are at least two rabbits here. N not in this case, Alan, but I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Alan, uh, I'm just going to take you back. To the person who changed my career as a coach, uh, the work of Percy uh, Sarudi or Sarity, depending on how we're pronouncing it this week. Um, he trained marathoners and long distance runners, and he used basic weightlifting 
In fact, it is the root of what easy strength is. Uh, I hate to say it, but uh, <laughs> I should give more credit to Percy for inventing what I now call even easier strength or easy strength or simple strength, depending where you are on the web that week. Basically, it's going to be a couple exercises. You're going to deadlift. You're going to press of some, some kind of press. Okay. Uh, Percy did not believe in uh, squats for his runners. He believed in hill sprints, and I agree 100%. So it's going to be deadlift. It's going to be a press of some kind. Uh, probably bench press because that's the easiest one. But if you work in a commercial gym, uh, train in a commercial gym, I would do military presses because the bench is never available. He recommended what he called a swing, but it's it would be different than the swing we see uh, in 2020. Um, a cheat curl and then sit-ups. But let's just simplify it even more for you because this is what I think you should do. I think you should deadlift, pull up, vertical press, okay? Uh, military press, one-arm press, some kind of press in that direction. Deadlift, pull up, vertical press, curl, ab wheel. Two sets of five on everything, do as many pull-ups as you can, and there's your program. Uh, do that three days a week. Ab wheel, you know, there's a place over here you can buy them for five bucks. Um, a set of ten or two sets of five. Um, on the curl, uh, Percy recommended that you cheat it a little bit. We call those power curls. Uh, back in the day, they were called cheat curls. The four-time Olympic gold medalist, uh, Al Order, did them very heavy. Uh, it's a marvelous exercise, much easier on your wrists and normal curls. Um, pretty simple program. Two sets of five, deadlift, pull up, overhead press, cheat curl, curl or cheat curl, ab wheel. Thank you very much. Um, write that into a book and make a lot of money on it. Good luck to you, Alan. And let's, know, let's find out how you did. We got a question from JT. Firstly, I would like to say thank you for everything you have done for the world of strength and conditioning. You know, JT, thank you. I've, it's been my, it's, it's been my passion since 1965 and I, and I love it. And I always have. I read Never Let Go on my first deployment and has completely changed how I approach my fitness goals. So thank you for that. And, and thank you. My question is regarding your opinion on using band resistance for squats and deadlift. Do you think they have added benefit? Okay. My attempts with band work with squats and deadlifts has been an absolute rabid failure. Uh, however, I agree with the principle and that's why I use chains. I get my chains, it's a local company so I can drive over and just buy them right there. But it's called Bigger, Faster, Stronger. Um, and literally it's, I mean, it's just not that far from my house. But what I like about their chains is that they're also collars. So, when, I, when I'm doing a squat with chains, we just slide those on, tighten them down, so there's collars and change. I like, I think I've said this before, that if I, if I could do one thing in my career differently, I'd have used chains on every press and every squat my entire career. The downside of chains is I can't yet figure out how to make them work for deadlifts. I have an idea, but it doesn't work out well. In my in my gym here at the house, I have this uh, I, these risers. Uh, I have these stackables that I can raise up a little bit. But the problem is, if I if I'm standing on them. Oh, okay. Uh, if you if you if you've never tried deadlifts with chains, the first deadlift works really well. You go and it makes all that it makes all that loud noise when chains come off. And when I put the weight down. My bumper plates land on the chains. So I have this vision of using, um, you know those big buckets you get like at Home Depot? Uh, somehow having the chains go into the buckets while I stand on the platform. But can you already see the problem with this? Look at how hard I'm working to make this thing work. I have a brand new, I have to go buy some stuff, I have to do this. So I love chains. I know a lot of people, my good friend uh, uh, Vinny Tanner uses uh, bands all the time. Westside uses bands all the time. It's great. If you can get them to work, they, they do they work? 
I mean, I hate to say better than chains. Um, I like chains because my chains weigh 57 pounds. And so when they're dangling, I know exactly how much load is on the bar. With bands, uh, as with especially here in Utah with our hot summers and our freezing cold winters, bands do break down very quickly here in Utah. And I mean that. I mean, that's my experience. So yes, they've got great, great benefits. Um, when I coached high school football, when we used chains, uh, it was clear that the kids were learning to accelerate. In fact, I started calling them coach chain because in the all the pressing movements and all the squatting movements, you're supposed to you're supposed to go down slow, up fast, down slow, up fast. Well, the chains, I never had to say that again because the chains made you go down slow, up fast because of the uh, 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 the resistance increasing as you went. So yes, big fan if you can make it work. Big fan, if you can make it work. Thank you. Roger has a question. My question problem is the one-handed kettlebell press and waiter carry. My left shoulder is weaker than my right. How can I address this issue? Well, Roger, um, you know, it'd be interesting to know your injury history or if you were maybe even born with something. Uh, we're all asymmetrical. Socrates told us this. Um, but if it's clearly weaker, there is there an issue going on? Um, it's time for me to brag again. But, uh, you know, at that RKC in San Jose, I pressed the beast with my right hand 13 times. I can only press it with my left twice. Well, that's a huge asymmetry. So one little thing I do, Roger, and I think there's some wisdom to it, is anytime you do one arm work, always let the less dominant side determine the reps for both sides. So if you can only do one, two, you're going to do one, two here. Now, hands will go up. Oh, shouldn't you work this as hard? Well, no. Because if you have an asymmetry and you keep pushing it more and more, it, it just keeps getting worse and worse. I got this from Taylor Lewis. He's a bright young guy in California, works with cystic fibrosis patients in Major League Baseball. And he told me this one time, he goes, and it was about mobility, but I ran with this. He goes, you know, let's just make it up. On a scale of one to 10, your right hip flexor is a six and your left, left is a three. Okay. Most people just keep stretching and doing mobility work. And one day I'm a nine here, but I'm a, six or five to my left. All that work kept me asymmetrical. His brilliant insight about mobility and flexibility is if you're tight on one side and you're a six on the other, you only stretch and do mobility on that, that three side, that four side, until you sneak up on symmetry. You might never get there. Now, in the weight room, I took that idea and I said, okay, when we're doing single side work, let the less dominant side dictate the numbers for the dominant side. A couple of things for your homework, Roger. If there's a medical issue, I'd like to know it. If there's a birth issue, like if you have siblings and they, they, they have the same issue, that'd be interesting to find out. And then finally, in, in training itself, let this uh, let your left side dictate the numbers for your right side. Arvin asks an interesting question. Can you discuss the tension requirements of the kettlebell movements? Okay, so he has a follow-up here. So when it comes to tension in the grind movements, you want to play with higher levels of tension. And the grinds are like the squat and the clean. But in the ballistic movements, you want to bring that down. So he says now specifically the swing and the snatch. So, with the swing and the snatch, and this is the reason I think it's so good for throwers, you need to bring your tension level. Now, I use the tension numbers of 1 to 10. Uh, 10 is when you stick your finger in an outlet and you're completely shocked and you're immobile. A 1 is when you're smoking dope in a hot tub. There's no tension at all. Where you want to be is somewhere around four or five on the tension level 
when it comes to the swing and the snatch. It, because you have to, you have to, it, it's, uh, I, I teach the, I teach the swing when I'm trying to use a metaphor for the swing. It's like there's two drums. Now, my head is, I'm, I'm swinging this way, okay? And this drum, I'm throwing the bell into this drum, boom! And then it's getting shot back into the drum that's behind my butt. Boom, 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 boom. But to allow that bell to fly quickly, I mean, I have to have steel wires for arms, okay? None of this nonsense, okay? It's, it's not a lift. It's a throw. Boom, 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 boom. You throw it out, you throw it back. You throw it out, you throw it back. For throwing, your tension level has to be around a four or five. So you probably, and that's why we do all that at the, the kettlebell certs, we spend so much time practicing uh, Relax and Win, the, 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 the system from Bud Winters at San Jose State, where you consciously uh, wiggle your jaw, shake out your arms, shake your legs. Um, you know, Bud Winters came up with it, and then it was invented by people later. But uh, that's, what you, that's what you really want to focus on, okay? I hope that helps you. It would be nice to be working with you when you try to explain something like tension because it is it does really help to be with someone to say okay shake it out wiggle your jaw smile okay shake it out wiggle your jaw smile and now boom go 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 okay so good question sometimes questions when it comes to movement are easier in the real world than it is answering on a podcast thank you well, thank you for listening. Remember, if you have questions, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com.